And um, so folks who maybe were not able to join us today, we can we could probably send out the recording to people as well. Um, so my name is Kelly Hinch and I am the Strategic Initiatives Director for Boulder County Public Health. And um, with me, I have a couple of colleagues. So um, Lane Drager from Boulder County Public Health. So Lane, I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself. Morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Lane and I work in our environmental health division and I'm the consumer protection coordinator and Kelly and I are um, building this liaison team to kind of work with our community on on the public health orders that uh, we already have and ones that potentially are coming. Thank you, Lane. Kate. Hi, everyone. My name is Kate Haywood. I'm an attorney with the Boulder County Attorney's Office and I represent public health. Great, thank you so much. So, you know, first, before we even start off on, on sort of this presentation and some of the discussion, I do want to thank you again for stepping onto this call and thank you, you know, for your partnership and coordination for last year as well. I know it was really tough with COVID and is really tough for you and your congregations and such. And so it's really, um, you know, we really see you as an important partner as we try to keep our community healthy. So thank you for all your coordination last year as well. I um, The goals for this meeting are to give you a bit of an update on the Delta surge or the, so this current surge that we're seeing throughout the states and including here in Colorado and Boulder County, provide some data on that and um, also share with you some of our thinking around um, you know, what sort of mitigation strategies can we take in order to um, um, make sure that we don't fall back into more restrictive sort of public health orders. So it's around maxi masking and vaccines and such. And frankly, to get your feedback and, you know, if we can answer any questions that we can, we'll certainly have opportunity to do that. Okay, so you can, um, we don't have a ton of people on the call, so you can certainly, um, um, I think Lane and Kate, if you can help me um, look at the 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 chat, that would be helpful as well. So, okay. Um, I think you know before I jump into a little slideshow to talk a little bit about um, uh, some of our Delta and our pol and our strategies. You know, I think it's important to note that you know our goal is to work together as a broad community, right? As Lane said, this is a liaison team, and so you all are part of. Our community partners and we're also working with the business community with schools uh, parks and rec um, municipalities um, in order to to do some of this work as well so again our goal is to mitigate the need to go back to more restrictive orders that we had last year right and also to look at longer term maybe a little bit more simple strategies than we had last year you know with the governor dropping new orders every now and then and things like that and and we also heard those at the same time you all did, which is really difficult for, to plan for that. So, you know, we're leading this effort as the county at this point. It's not, these are not really state mandated at this point anyway. We also want to try to set some easy metrics that you all can follow, right? That not just you all, but the whole community can look at to say, to help guide us decide, you know, what sort of things that, that we want to do with the community and particularly around masking and vaccination. So what I'm going to be doing, I'm going to share my screen, crossing fingers that this works because sometimes it's difficult. Um, I jump into that one, please work for me. And can you all see this? Awesome, great. Um, and you know, I think that um, if y'all have any questions, um, Chime in. I can't see your hands raised. So if you want to pipe pipe in, or maybe Kate or Lane can tell me if somebody has their hands raised on this, we can certainly do that. Or we can run through this as well and we'll have a robust discussion after a run through the slide presentation. Okay. That sounds good, Kelly. Um I think it makes a lot of sense to do questions after the presentation. Is it possible to put your slides in presenter mode so they're a little larger? Is that your next question? Perfect. Just a second. How do you do that again, Kate? I'm sorry. You I'm blank. It's a little. Um, it's at the top, next to the hand. It's that little slideshow looking. This button. one. This one. Yeah, that should do it. Okay. Great. Wait, actually, let's see if it does. Oh, 
Perfect. <laughs> That's good. That's Thank good. you. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to share with you again some North Star goals that we have as public health. These aren't like our written goals or anything like that. These are just our goals that we're looking at with and when we when we are talking about our COVID response and mitigation for um, COVID. So first one is to prevent unnecessary deaths and significant illness. A second goal is not to overwhelm the healthcare system. And our third goal is to safely return to quote unquote normal activities, right? So what can we do to make sure that we can have, you know, as much normal activities as well and we don't have lockdowns and things like that. And we all, we do feel that widespread vaccination is the key to freedom and protecting people, the economy and our infrastructure. And um, so what's the next one, sorry. So right now, and this is a little bit, this is an old slide as you see through August right now. So. From July 5th to August 9th, this is community transmission in the states. And so with the darker areas, of course, being high community transition. So you can see where, you know, across the US, we've really um, moved toward high transition in most places. So on goal one, preventing unnecessary deaths and significant illness, we understand that Delta at this point is nearly 100% of all COVID cases in Colorado. It's like two to three times more transmi transmissible than the wild COVID cases, wild type. So, and it's similar to like chicken pox, right? So if you know that if you haven't had chicken pox you're in the same room with somebody, there's a pretty high likelihood that you could catch that, right? And we also know that that there are Delta carriers, including the pe folks who are vaccinated that spread the, the, the virus and do so earlier in the course of an infection. So we're also looking at the Lambda variant, which is in 42 states, but we don't know what that impact will be at this point. And um, so this large amount of case, case transmissions also is strengthening the likelihood of a potential for a more serious variant that maybe our current vaccines might have more trouble impacting. So for youth, we are seeing um, about 4,000 cases and 37 deaths when we did this original slide, right? And we're seeing a lot more youth hospitalizations across the US, uh, folks, youth coming out with more longer term COVID, um, long haul COVID symptoms, neurological problems. And so I think that this is a concerning piece for us, right? We, we last year, it was a little bit less, right? So in to date, and I'm not sure uh, this is updated at this point, so don't hold me on this one, but, you know, we've had like 12 uh, COVID deaths, um, related deaths in Boco since in Boulder County since June. And that's probably risen at this point. Um, so again, in the state trends, hospitalizations are increasing and we're not really expecting a peak increase until like December. So um, a reproductive rate in Colorado when this slide was made uh, about a week ago or more was like 1.3 in the metro area, which means that we're seeing increases in cases and around one in 250 more or less Coloradans are infectious. As in this slide, you can see some of the cases in the Denver metro area by county, right? And so you can see how we spiked here last year in December. And as you can see now, we're sort of moving on an upward trend. And we've seen a little bit of plateauing, but I think some pieces are going up as well. That's a tough one with a lot of lines. I think another thing we're seeing is case trends among youth group around age groups, right? So if you look at this, you can see this is from um, May 17th of this year, and this was around early. This is before school started, basically. And as you can see on these spaces, zero to nine and um, 23 to 34 and 35 to 44 were particularly high cases, so we're concerned about um, uh, transmission in youth still, especially these under these zero to nine, which don't have vaccination approved yet. And we're, um, you know, with school starting, we're, we're hopefully that most schools are complying with the mask orders and, and after school programs too, right? So part of that public health masking orders with schools was also making sure that like kids sports activities and things like that 
um, that are in facilities that may not be schools, for example, are also need to mask according to this public health mandate. And Kate could probably speak to that a little bit more if you have questions around that. Um, so why are we concerned about cases, right? Um, so cases without community immunity bring greater levels of hospitalizations and deaths. And so our hospitalizations and deaths will get worse before they get better. And again, case, additional cases breed variants that could undermine our vaccine. So this is just a county comparison. I think these numbers, again, are a little bit outdated. Uh, was that a conference and negative chance to check these up? But I think they're still in the ballpark of the same range, right? The big thing I might take away from this is that, especially Boulder County, a lot of people commute into Boulder County. So we have counties with higher case rates around us. And so including Weld County, Arapahoe, Denver, Adams County, for example. And so we want to make sure that we understand that this just not we're not living in a in a, you know, dome in Crested Boulder County, that there's lots of uh, folks that come into county to the county and even from, you know, places where there's particularly high transmission rate like Florida and Texas and things like that. So our second goal is um, don't overwhelm the healthcare system. So right now, Boulder County hospital beds are like 60 to 87% capacity, right? And then some of that is we're increased staffing challenges and some, some severe staffing challenges. I think there's been a lot of burnout around medical and, and public health staff around that. And you may say, well, you know, how much of that is COVID? And we're not really sure, but the idea is that if, if there's a lot of beds being taken up by COVID and you, you know, need um, an ICU bed and there isn't one, I mean, that's the case, right? So that we're seeing a lot of places like Louisiana and other sp spaces where we're having much larger outbreaks. And we are at this point that people are being turned away, right? Or they have to be sent to another hospital or whatever, because there isn't space for that. Um, and we are taking patients from other counties and frankly, even other states at this point. So, you know, right now we're working on a surge response for this, right? How do we, you know, working with our um, um, hospital partners to figure out that. Um, goal three was safely return to normal activities, right? So right now, according to the CDC, because we you know, took away the dial, right? So the CDC has a different sort of um, system around low and high transmission. And right now we're in a high transmission phase, right? And also, I think it's important to note that, especially with some of the home testing, we're, we feel cases are currently undercounted. And we hear from um, the Colorado, Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment that they're finding that might be as much to 50 to 100% higher than some of the cases that we're actually being, that we actually are able to count, right? So vaccines is an important one as well. So we looked at the total population in the county. And before we looked at spaces like amount, you know, amount of eligible people who are vaccinated. And it was a little bit higher when we did that, but we, you know, we understood that we need to look at the entire county. So right now we're sitting about 66%, 66.3% of people with both vaccines and around 72% with one vaccine. And we have about 113,000 people not vaccinated. So we have seen an increase of people trying to get vaccines, but um, we still have a long ways to go and, um, you know, there's still some ineligible population and we have about 13,500 people more or less. I mean, a compromised are people who can medically cannot get the vaccine as well. So those people are particularly high risk um, for getting the virus. And of course, people returning to schools and offices and, you know, we're looking ahead at another fall and winter where there could be a cold mingling of flu as well um, if we don't take precautions. So this is a county, some of their county transmit, uh, transmission tracker map. And you can see, again, um, in our area, there's, there's um, um, you know, high transmission all around us. So what's our roadmap forward? So the first thing we talk about is vaccinations, right? And I think Pearson did the sign is vaccinations, vaccinations, vaccinations. We're trying to um, get people to be get vaccinated, right? And I think that's going to be really our main strategy um, to get thing to to get you know where we need to be. So 
Um, so that's one approach. And the second one is maybe a layered mitigation strategies with an emphasis on masking during periods of significant transmission. So that was, those are some of the main ways we're lo looking at the roadmap forward for this. So on vaccines, you know, we know that the vaccine at this point protects from, protects from severe illness and death. So the unvaccinated are currently like 80% of our cases, 87% of our hospitalizations, and 92% of our deaths total. Oops, sorry. Um, and in hey, Kelly, the context, I, there's a there's a question that I think this slide is good to to illustrate. The question about avoiding unnecessary deaths, yeah. and mm -hmm. really that's looking at this information because we have a vaccine now and so we have a way to prevent those hospitalization and deaths. So as we see these numbers still being really extreme, we know that those hospitalizations and deaths, you know, there is a, a, a very viable solution uh, beyond some of the additional mitigation strategies we'll talk about. But that vaccine is is kind of that key to looking at those unnecessary hospitalization and deaths. Great. Thank you, Lane. And, you know, Another piece of context to this is that even if you're vaccinated, you have the ability to spread COVID. And again, we have close to 100,000 people in, in Boulder County to vaccinate yet. And I think for me, especially working, I worked for 20 something years in global health before this. And, you know, the transmission breeds new variants that may be resistant. I mean, we're in Delta because people weren't vaccinated and was able to, to mutate to a variant. So we want to try to avoid that if possible. Um, this is, again, just a map. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, again, 66% of total Boulder County population is fully vaccinated. Okay. So we want to talk a bit about masking. And I, I think many of you have seen this, this graphic, but I think it's good for us to, to just sort of point it out again that you know, there's a high risk of spread if both pe people are not masked, a little bit lower, or sorry, a, um, a moderately high risk if one person is masked and, and the carrier is the person who is um, not masked, right? And there's a lower spread if the COVID carrier is masked and the healthy person is not, and it's very low if you guys are both masked, the, per the people are both masked. So, I think it's good just to look at this again and the value of masking. As you can see, this is not like 100% effective. It's a strategy, right? So again, this is continued layer, right? So we talk about social distancing, masking, hygiene. So putting these this sort of Swiss cheese layered mitigation strategy is what we really thinking that would be protective, right? And we have to try to put these pieces in place. And some of these are shared responsibilities. Some of them are personal responsibilities. So, um, you know, before we had a vaccine, we were lo really looking at, and as you all recall, we had shutdowns, we had masking, we had um, limitations on number of people in buildings and those type of things like that. And, the, and so we're looking at, um, Again, vaccines to help prevent overwhelm, overwhelming the healthcare system, and um, and continuing ensuring that a continue continuation of operations for y'all, for businesses, schools, houses of worship, and so the vaccines will help will allow us to help shift that strategy maybe. And with Delta returning to masking as a secondary public health strategy to help prevent transmission, so we want to make sure that we all can keep open and and. Um, prevent additional variants. So this is my favorite slide, actually. So this really, again, indicates these are sort of the essential but less burdensome strategies, and we're sort of at looking at these bases right here. And because we want it to prevent ourselves from getting in these more burdensome strategies, like business closures or limited gatherings and remote work and learning and broad quarantines. So our goal is to work really hard at this end so we don't have to be over here. That makes sense. And we also, I think for public health, looking at this as ethical considerations, you know, to duty to protect the public. Um, 
including our public safety and first responders and front facing staff and things and um and also public and high risk populations who can't choose like who serves them right and um there's undue risk um risk due to concentrations of unvaccinated and we want to be able to model um, leadership for the rest of the community as public health as well. So on the, some of these vaccine policies, people say, well, what vaccine policies are out there? But this is just a small list of um, private and public sector um, uh, folks in our, that are in our county who have vaccine policies in place. So we're, at, we're looking at, you know, helping businesses and supporting businesses or other community organizations or members to put together a vaccine policy. So we're out there and this is part of our goal as well. Um, let's go there. Whoops, sorry, wrong way. And also we've seen, you know, COVID vaccine passports being adopted like in these different cities here and also applying to <laughs> indoor restaurants, bars and gyms and entertainment are, are being sort of channel to vaccine eligible groups. And we've seen some of that in Boulder already for some restaurants. We've certainly seen it in different places, right? So we want to promote vaccine in order to, um, you know, make sure that people are safe. And so and allow spaces for people who may not be, who may, um, you know, want to be in spaces where others are vaccinated and feel more safe. Um, so our recommendation is public health around um, is basically organizational policies requiring vaccines when possible, right? I know that's not possible for everyone, and universal masking when significant transmission is occurring. And additional options we're looking at, but maybe public health orders on vaccine mandates for essential workers or a public health order on universal indoor masking during significant transmission. So we're looking at those options. We're going to talk about that a bit. Oh, that's made in my slideshow. So, you know, these are the two places where we want to land, right? We're looking at um, we're looking at a potential public health order around um, universal indoor masking during significant transmission. And um, that's something I think we're still in the works of doing that hasn't been implemented or put out as a public health order at this point. And um, the idea of getting you all together was to see if you had questions, if we had any feedback or input to that, or what we could, um, you know, create a conversation and a coordination around um, if these orders do indeed um, come into place. Kelly, I was just going to share one other piece that's being considered as part of the Board of Health um, looking at a public health order for indoor masking. There's hopefully going to be a provision that could provide exemptions and that would be looking at facilities that would apply to us that have um, universal vaccination programs. So for all of you, if you have something where your congregations are all vaccinated, that could provide exemptions to you wearing masks for your indoor activities. Um, we certainly would continue to encourage where you can do outdoor programming, that's definitely a much lower risk, and and we I, this time are not considering an outdoor masking order, but definitely want to have um, dialogue and look at programs that can provide again levels of protection. We know the vaccine is going to be incredibly effective uh, at preventing disease, more so than just masks alone. So we want to have incentives to for you to have those kind of abilities to look at policies that you can put in place. And, and support getting back to that other goal of having as much normal life activity as we can. Um, and we know we have a, a great solution to provide that. Great. So on this significant transmission question, um, which is a really good one, and I don't know if Lane or Kate have a, had um, additional information at this point, but I think that we're looking more at the CDC of idea of significant transmission. And but I think, frankly, that, you know, before we put in any public health order, if that indeed is going to be the way we go, then we're going to be very clear on that. And that should be one of the things we're going to have clear metrics on, because our idea, again, is in the long run is not to say, hey, we're doing this right now and then we'll see what happens later on. Right. We want to have a longer term strategy 
that where we can easily flow, you know, uh, so let's say that we fall below that and there's a, and there's a, I don't know, like a month in time or whatever, um, that we have lower transmission and maybe some of the masking pieces go away, but maybe it comes back again, right? So we want to have a very clear sort of space where, where the community can follow this, right? And it's just, you know, people can just jump on board with that, right? So we're, we're not like hitting these spaces every single, you know, every single time there's a shift in, in um, COVID cases and things like that, if that makes sense. And thank you, Kate reposted the slide that, that Kelly had shared showing kind of where the, the country is at, but the CDC is, has their tiering and high is, is the term that's being used. So we'll try not to uh, confuse and use different different terms, but yes, high transmission, that's where we're at currently, and that's what's kind of driving the public health order for masking. So that CDC tracking of, you know, cases per 100,000, and we're definitely in the high category right now. And as Kelly showed, the trend, unfortunately, is still on a, on a steep climb. So we're not sure that it's going to level off until potentially even the winter or later. Yeah. The project, projecting part is what is most difficult with this pandemic because we have no idea what additional strains are going to come our way, what their impact will be. We certainly don't know what people's personal actions will be. Um, so we want to stay in this proactive place as much as possible. In fact, we're kind of already into a reactive one. Um, so we need to make sure community has buy-in and support and can put as many additional layers in place so that we aren't getting to those incredibly restrictive steps. Yeah, and I will let you know, and I think I, I feel this is valuable to share that, you know, we, even at public health, I mean, we are not, are not super happy about mask mandates and things like that. I mean, we also live in a community and, and um, but we do feel that it is, a, again, a way to ensure that things don't get worse and we have to go to more restrictive spaces. And I think that's really um, where we're coming from at this, right? We want to, it's tr that goal number three to keep us as normal as possible. And and um, so that's why we're talking about that. Kate. Um, thanks, Kelly. Um, <clears throat> so you've, you've painted a pretty good uh, picture of um, the situation we're in now and, you know, projecting um, into, you know, later fall and winter of this year, um, you know, as mentioned in one of the questions in the chat and as well, just, you know, familiar, familiarized with various religious holidays that are going to be coming up during this time period. You know, I would expect uh, many of the organizations represented on this call to have some pretty big gatherings planned. Um, in anticipation of those events. Um, would you be able just to speak to the resources that Boulder County Public Health has in order to work with these organizations to put, you know, preventative measures in place? You know, I'm pretty confident everyone on this call wants wants to do the right thing and, and try to prevent disease transmission, but it can just sort of be difficult when we're dealing with large numbers of people. Um, I know public health has worked with organizations, you know, individually in the past. Um, could you just maybe speak to that a little more? Sure. sure. So I, I think in Lane, you can jump in as well. I, you know, the, the idea is we're forming a liaison team that that Lane mentioned before, right? So we're going to have a team of folks who are going to be specifically dedicated, like we had last year with y'all, right? So a specific group of folks who are going to be dedicated to answering questions you may have about some of those gatherings. Do you need support around signage or to walk through a um, you know, some plans you may have for a gathering and things like that. So I think we'll have, you know, we we might have some more limited bandwidth than we had last year potentially, but I think that um, this is part of standing up the liaison team again is to be able to provide some of that support to y'all, right? I don't want anyone to feel that, you know, you're sort of hung out there with no information or whatnot. We want to make sure that, that you feel comfortable and if indeed this masking mandate um, is passed. Right. So again, I want to reiterate one of the questions is in the chat was, um, are we going to do that? And I we haven't done that yet. I you know, want to reiterate that um, there's in discussions. Right. So and that could happen. So that's when we want to reach out proactively at this point instead of, you know, like it was last year, something's passed and then we reach out to you. Right. But this gives you an opportunity to ask questions and to prep ahead. Lane. And I was just going to mention 
we are, are, are expecting the Board of Health to meet at some point next week. Um, the date has not been set yet, but we do expect that they would meet to discuss um, and then that there could be uh, an adoption at that point. We've also requested if it is adopted to still give an additional delay in implementation so that we would have a chance to reach back to all of our uh, various community groups and let them know exactly what was passed and give you all the, again the tools to to be ready to implement that um, so again those are all the projected timelines we don't have any definitives uh, as of yet I will say that I do expect the board is likely to pass an order um, and just the the exact details of it. You know, that's where I don't know exactly what will get passed. We um, we do expect that there will be uh, a, we're going to propose an exemption program like I mentioned, so that would be something that I think this group particularly may be interested in pursuing and we would be very happy to work with you on how you can kind of build a, a vaccination program and that could potentially allow you to to not have to wear masks indoors. So again, we really want to support folks getting vaccinated. That's still our, our number one North Star and then these other mitigation strategies are important to still prevent. Uh, the additional disease because we are seeing breakthrough cases even for vaccinated folks. Um, Great, thank you, Lane. Kelly, um, I, I will also add that um, the precise parameters of a potential order absolutely have not been ironed out. Um, this meeting, along with other meetings with other um, business sectors, are part of a concerted effort on the part of Boulder County Public Health to stake hold and, and get feedback from organizations that are going to be impacted. We don't live in your world, so if there are you know, certain aspects of your work that you know need to be brought to our attention, we absolutely would love for you to provide us that information so that we can take it into account um, and incorporate feedback into the precise language of the order. Um, you know, we're a year and a half into this. As Kelly mentioned, we're all sick of this. Um, but one thing we have learned over the past year and a half is we need to hear from you to be successful. Um, so I really appreciate everyone hopping on this call and, and asking really great questions. And Kelly, what is the best um, way for people to provide us that feedback? Um, do we have a, do we still have the COVID biz email or, or directly to you and Lane? What would be your preference for that feedback? Um, uh, Lane, what do you feel? I mean, we could receive them, but I don't know if COVID biz would be better. Yeah, we're, we used uh, a COVID biz email. So I'll, I think Kate's already on it. She's, uh, she's so fast. So we love Kate. She's the best. Um, so we had a, a team email and we're getting that reorganized. Um, so the team initially sunset in June and unfortunately with the Delta variant, we're needing to reestablish it. So that's probably the best way to reach us. And we hopefully by next week we'll have uh, have folks starting to assemble so that we can be more responsive. Um, but definitely bear with us as we're trying to rebuild this this team. Yeah, and just to, to follow up at what Lane was saying, so Lane and I have been tasked. Um, we have some some other work that we do with within the COVID response, but we're standing up this team. So maybe other folks as well that uh, reach out to you eventually in the future and things like that. So I just want to give you a heads up that it may not always be Lane or myself or Kate. Um, Lane, I don't know. Um, David has a question in the chat around ionization and I'm not sure that can answer that. I don't know if you can. I'm going to try to find there was a, a great presentation that I saw on just indoor environments, ventilation systems, things that are very helpful, things that are not very helpful and actually can cause more problems. So I'm going to see if I can track that down. I don't know if it was recorded or not, but at least get some links and resources. I definitely would encourage you to reach out to professionals as you're thinking of revamping or adding systems. Uh, don't just go with, you know, something that somebody said is wonderful and hearsay. Uh, there are systems that actually can cause more indoor air quality problems, especially ones that release ozone as part of what they do. Um, that is a, a major um, indoor air problem, you know, that we do not want people breathing in ozone. Um, so there are definitely things you can do that are very effective, but there are some steps that we definitely would not want you to, to go down those roads. So um, I'm going to see if I can track that down and I can we can blast it out to this group so you get some good resources. 
because um, there's some great local um, professors and folks that have done a lot of research and, and compiled a lot of information. And I just want to reiterate as well as we look at some more questions, we have time if folks want to post any questions that certainly we can certainly have some more time to answer those. But, um, you know, I also want um, as part of the feedback for any public health order that may be coming down to Pike, I also again would really as part of that feedback um, look at um, identifying for us what needs you may have, right? As Kate was saying, how can we be helpful? Because sometimes we don't see those spaces and maybe you have a lot better idea of what those are. And that allows us again to be more responsive. Kate. Um, thanks, Kelly. Also taking a look at the, ch the chat, we have a couple of questions about a possible vaccine mandate for um, essential workers and a potential religious exemption. Um, I will add that, you know, there's discussions of a vaccine mandate for essential workers here in Boulder County, similar to what's already been enacted in Denver, uh, city and county in Denver. Um, I would I would expect, although you can't quote me, I would expect that there would be some type of a religious exemption um, for that mandate. I, I can't speak to the precise parameters, um, but in determining, you know, whether to include that religious exemption, um, that's a decision that would be, you know, primarily left to the the county attorney's office and, and the county attorney's office guidance to public health and its director. Um, and just based on, you know, some of the insight I have into some of that research and analysis, it seems likely that there would be um, a religious exemption for a vaccine mandate or an alternative such as testing and mas masking, that type of thing. Um, but I can't speak to too many more details than that, but I did want to address those questions. And I can just add that I know right now Boulder County is really looking to partner with entities so that they can put their own policies in place. So both at a office business level, certainly, you know, faith based community, you know, you can look at your own policies because they have a, a much broader reach, you know, what than what public health um, order would reach. We wouldn't have an order that reached every single person in our community uh, as a mandate. We would be looking more at essential workers. So there's plenty of people who would not qualify into those categories. So um, so I think that's definitely the, the first step and depending on the success of of those those other efforts. Kelly showed a slide that there are a lot of folks who have already proactively gone down this road. We also know of local businesses that are already looking at vaccine uh, requirements to be indoors in their businesses. I know Red Rocks has even had concerts that are requiring the, the patrons to be vaccinated. So there's a lot of efforts that people are being proactive, knowing that that is a huge way to reduce the risk and still have the activities and the things that they want to do. So that's really the route we want to continue to go. And, and again, work with all of you that are interested in, in pursuing that, giving you kind of some of the model model language of other programs. Uh, we're probably going to be hosting a webinar on the 9th uh, through the Boulder Chamber of Commerce. So we'll get that information out to you that will probably have more information about, you know, what does it look like? Answer a lot of the questions. There's a lot of misinformation that people say it's we can't legally put these kind of policies in place. Um, so trying to help people understand that that there that it is legal to do these kind of things. There are certain exemptions like Kate mentioned that still would need to be, you know, integrated into some of those policies, but um, but it's something that we want to support people doing. Great. Any other questions? I know we've got some stuff popping in the chat and it's I'm, I'm also very excited to see the collaboration that you folks that have already investigated stuff sharing with others. That's definitely one of the goals that we have is uh, this has to be a community effort. I think somebody even mentioned that, that we have to be in this together. This is us versus a virus. This is not public health versus the community. This is not one group against the other. We have to be, you know, coming together on this because we won't get solutions otherwise. You know, if we keep escalating issues and wanting to fight on issues and everybody wants to get entrenched and, you know, hold their, you know, we aren't going to solve a disease that's, you know, spreading across our world. So we've got to be, we've got to be in this together uh, and come up with viable solutions. And I, I do if if before we sign off, I do have one um, additional request from from this community. Um, our um, communications team 
is looking for somebody from the faith community, in particular someone who, who may speak Spanish, to be able to help us on some um, communications pieces with the Latinx Hispanic community around masking and vaccines as well. So, um, you know, if there's anybody who's interested in that, please reach out to me directly because um, that's part of my team. And um, my email, um, I'll type it in here. Um, one sec. And so, yeah, if anybody's interested in that, um, just uh, let me know because it would be super appreciated and is a good way for us to collaborate with y'all as well and, and outreach to those communities. Thanks, Kelly. And I do see a question in the chat, you know, just about, you know, potential violations. I will just add that um, Boulder County Public Health is re-standing up its enforcement team. Um, we had a pretty robust and effective um, enforcement team throughout the course of that pandemic. It was stood down in June. We're standing it back up. Um, but basically, you know, how enforcement works from our end is um, we receive reports, you know, primarily from community members concerned about violations in um, various facilities that they um, enter. And we receive those reports. We will conduct education and outreach to the facility to try to bring them into compliance, give them whatever additional resources they may need to comply. Um, you know, through that education and outreach, if we're not attaining compliance, if we're, you know, identifying willful violations, um, we can escalate enforcement action and actually file um, a civil suit against the organization for injunctive relief in court. We have the authority under the public health statutes. Um, over the course of the pandemic, we've taken several businesses to court for willful violations, and we've been successful in each one. And each um, action has resulted in an abatement of the violations. So we hear you. We, you know, we do expect some level of noncompliance. I suspect from people not on this call, because the people on this call want to do the right thing. Um, and so when it comes to that, um, you know, we will respond accordingly. Yeah, it's an unfortunate. We, you know, enforcement is our, our last resort, um, but if it's necessary, we, we have capacity to do that. We would much prefer to work with folks, get them the resources, get them to, to be able to find those solutions. You know, I appreciate seeing those the comments in the chat of how can people be proactive um, there's a lot of things you can do. And, and again, we want to see people be successful. Um, vaccination is is your number one North Star. Having social distancing, that's the next best mitigation strategy. If people aren't close enough to even spread the disease, that's great. Masking, doing symptom checking, really encouraging people who are ill to go get tested and definitely not join your, your in-person events um, where you can offer some remote opportunity for higher risk populations. Those are great strategies. So um, as you have other thoughts or things, please reach out to us. But all the strategies we used last year should be at your fingertips. You know, those are all the things that work. Um, being outdoors, much lower risk. Uh, indoors, you know, I see a lot of people talking about your ventilation system. So as you are able to increase the airflows and add additional filtration things, Indi individual fans blowing are not a good idea. Things that blow one person's air right into another person's face, those are not effective strategies. So again, it is important to think through what you're doing instead of just, you know, throwing a whole bunch of, of things out there. Sometimes they're they're more problematic than solution oriented. So, but yeah, we're we're happy to 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 help folks think through those because we don't want to get into cancellations and and stopping events from happening, but we want to help you craft ones that are going to be uh, as risk free as possible. Yeah, that's exactly right, Elaine. Elaine, we did have a question in the chat around um, somebody who is having um, um, holiday services outdoors in a tent. Um, I assume it's a walled tent. It, um, they didn't say that. Um, that would be the same as being indoors. Is that correct? Or yeah, for the previous public health orders, it is. I mean, again, we're looking at airflow. So if if the it is just an overhead tent where the walls are not up, that would be that provides you the same airflow as just being outside. But it gives you a relief in case there's you know sun and, and rain issues. So so no walls looks like that. So that's perfect. Um, and then even adding additional air filtration systems, you know, 
may or may not even be that extra effective depending on how the wind's blowing that's going to do uh, more to move air than anything else but definitely having vaccinations having people socially distance even adding masks outdoors you're just adding additional layers of protection that are going to be helpful and then thinking about if there's a person speaking just separating them further from the crowd or if there's folks that are singing keeping them separated because if they are unmasked you're just reducing the risk because those those singing activities are going to project more droplets and have more potential for spread so yeah and outdoors gives you a lot more space to work with so um, all great ideas and all all good strategies they're going to help reduce again I, the only things that i didn't see were making sure to, to mention if anybody is ill having any of those kind of covid symptoms that they should not attend definitely to have them get tested um, and uh, and if there are higher risk folks maybe if there is remote viewing opportunities things for them to still participate but not have to physically be there those are going to be great opportunities or if there's ways to stagger the event to not have the entire group together where you could do smaller groups that would be another way to further reduce risks but um but i i really appreciate that there's already forethought going into how can you do this but also really minimize risk yeah great and there's also a question around um um doing an outdoor animal blessing and is there an issue around animal transmission i don't know that um we haven't had anything where it, this is a vector or animal born disease so a risk of getting the disease from animals um so that that has not been something that, that there's any mitigation strategies around so um, and if you're masked especially i think it's a good thing yeah and definitely don't put plastic bags over people's head that would not be a strategy we would want so appreciate appreciate the humor we definitely need that in this time so makes me think of things like Saturday Night Live and Dan Aykroyd and selling selling toys to kids like it's a bag of glass, you know, like what kid wouldn't want to play with a bag of glass? <laughs> yeah, I can't do it on here and it messes up my phone, so. Okay, we still have a few minutes if folks um, have any other questions or or not, or we can give you some time back. Yeah, I can probably send you these slides. I want to double check with somebody first around this, but um, we've been able to share some of these PowerPoint slides. So, and maybe it's a good way for y'all to speak with folks in your in in your community who may have some doubts around this or may have some misinformation too. So, um, so if we can, if I can send those, I'll get them out to you as soon as possible. And Kelly, just real quick before we sign off, I do see a question in the chat, you know, kind of a question related to some CDC data. Um, you know, one of our priorities here at Boulder County is helping people to understand the data and where there may be perceived discrepancies, you know, reconciling those so that people understand what the picture looks like. We have some really great data and surveillance people on our team. Um, I'd request that any questions related to data um, and asking for clarifications about data, if you could just email those to us, we will have our colleagues, you know, look into those issues and, and get you an informed answer. I'm not sure that the three of us are prepared at this point to, to analyze the CDC data, but but whenever you know people identify discrepancies, we absolutely want to hear about them to help clarify the messaging for the public. So we'd greatly appreciate it if you could just shoot us an email to that effect. That'd be great. Yeah, and I, yeah. I want to I want to yeah. add also really quick that I also manage that team. So I you know want to make sure that they 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 get a lot of questions, and so it may not be like a super quick turnaround. But our goal is to you know when they're legitimate questions because we get some who are kind of crazy, then um, then we'll get back to you because these are, like Kate says, it's important for you, for the community to understand data and for us to pick up things, right? That may be, there may be discrepancies or issues with. And and also on part of this, you know, I think the part about youth in particular yeah. is, it may be that youth don't have a high level of hospitalization, although I think we are seeing more um, in some more longer term COVID issues, you know, they are still sort of um, transmitting it to other folks, maybe immunocompromised someplace else or, you know, a grandma and grandpa or things like that. And so these are sort of the issues we we um, 
we definitely want to make sure that we're still looking at kids as well. And I, I see also in you know, a request for more of the information science. Um, so I think we can we can look at how we share information, certainly on the data side. Uh, Kelly's team is putting out um, a report on a weekly basis. So depending on how much people want, you know, we can certainly give you probably more data than you ever wanted. So if, if that's something that folks want to see, we can definitely give those weekly updates so you're you're in tune with with every nuance that's being tracked and there is a lot um, and a lot of demographic information because we're still seeing disparities so there's a lot of information that that's being tracked um, and it is a challenge because when you're looking at local state federal data things don't always match up because of how things are being reported you know if it's hospitals themselves versus county of residents so that's where things get askew is as kelly talked about our hospitals are accepting patients and and colorado is seeing influx of patients from other states so um, hospitals can get overwhelmed even if the boulder county case count of how many boulder county residents were sick and hospitalized looks different than what our hospital systems are experiencing so there's lots of nuances of the data that make things like well you're not even saying the same thing and and it is it's just how how that is being tracked and so that is just a challenge that we have to try to explain versus saying the numbers will always match up because they they don't for for some of those reasons and to echo lane's first point um you all, we need you. You are influential leaders in our community. We never want you to want for information. Mm -hmm. Our job is to get the information that you need to help, you know, spread the word um, to your members. So please, um, COVID biz, you can email Kelly, Lane, me directly, any and all of us. We will make sure that you get the information you request and need. Great. We're looking at some of the questions. So, you know, some of the other components and I there's been so much chat, which is great. I haven't missed may have missed some stuff. I'm just looking at the most recent stuff, but our data tracking, you know, those North Stars that Kelly was showing, we're going to continue to look at our healthcare system. You know, as that capacity gets strained, that's where more invasive strategies are going to be needed. So as we see um, those hospitalizations and ICU bed capacity get strained, that's where we're going to have to have additional steps. Um, the things that are our metrics also are overall case counts and vaccination rate. That tells us what's happening with our prevention um, side as far as how many cases is it increasing or decreasing? That's the trend in the virus. It's going the wrong way. What are our vaccination rates telling us? Are we seeing anywhere close to a possible herd immunity, um, which now with the Delta variant, that has been a moving target. It has gotten higher and higher. So the projections are really more into the 90, 95% vaccination rates to truly have herd immunity with the Delta variant. Because again, we're seeing 20% of our cases as breakthrough. And from what I understand, that data is about to be updated in Boulder County. It's even higher for breakthrough cases. So, so again, this is why all those layered mitigation are so important. That vaccine alone is not going to solve it, but it is our first and foremost step we have to get in place, then we look at masks and social distancing and hopefully don't have to get to closures and minimizing number of folks and things like that that are going to really impact your world and all of our world. So I think to Kelly's point, we work in public health, but we also are community members. We have to deal with all of these issues too. Our kids have to wear masks when they go to school and we need to wear masks when we're indoors. And uh, I am already looking at when my booster vaccination will be because I will be at my eight months here probably uh, sometime next year, next month. So, so all these things impact us individually too. So we get it and we get the strains on our personal lives as well. But we, we need to make sure this variant doesn't turn into yet another variant that's even more lethal uh, and has even more capacity to to compromise our vaccine. Hey, hey, Lane, I want to also um, address Matthew's great question um, in the chat there. I think so. Um, you know, again, I think part of the strategy, this this layered strategy around vaccination and masking and is so we again we don't go back to isolation right we don't go back to 
um, that. And so, you know, we're looking at, you know, this layer, particularly as masking, right? If you're not, people are not vaccinated, at least masking, and that's going to allow people to still be able to get together. And so our, our goal is to make sure that pe that's still possible, right? That people can gather. And, and we're just, you know, talking about masking in that. And I also want to say that, you know, we're putting together um, a very, ro I think the county, not just public health, but the county as well, we're working on an incredibly robust uh, mental and behavioral health um, community recovery work as well. So we're putting a fair amount of resources into that. And because we know that that's an issue and it was an issue before COVID, frankly, and so a public health issue before COVID. So, you know, we're not looking at these um, like a public health order in, in, in a vacuum, right? We have a lot of community recovery pieces and response um, work as well that dovetails with this, that has the mutually support one another, et cetera. So I think that that is something um, to keep in mind when we're thinking about this. And um, I think um, the faith community is incredibly important in some of those mental and behavioral health spaces. And that's another team that is <laughs> that I work with. And they may be, you know, this may be a conduit that we all reach out to you once um, we start being um, maybe, um, rolling out some of those other work that we want to do with that. Yeah, I think it's so important because the faith community is a, an essential piece to mental health support. Uh, so COVID has just put a strain on a system and a priority that existed and, and it's just made it worse. So there's no doubt about that. Um, and it and it's got to be important that that our strategies uh, find find those bridges. So because we need people to still have support, you know, mental health has been a strategic priority for Boulder County Public Health before COVID, you know, became a thing and it, and it will stay a priority for us. So um, it's just been a challenge that COVID has, has definitely gotten the spotlight, but there's so many issues and things that public health is engaged in to, to address the needs of our community. And mental health is definitely, it is definitely one of the priorities. Okay. So we're at 11. So we look forward to hearing from you all. Pardon? Sorry, I so, have to Yeah. So yeah, we're going to drop off. We have going through meetings and things like that. I just wanted to give you back some time. Um, but again, we really appreciate um, your, you know, your support and coordination and um, look forward to hearing from you. So we'll probably be in touch next week um, potentially as well, but we'll see how the things go and we'll go from there. Thanks so much.